Hey, everybody, welcome back uh, to, uh, oh, and I'll hand it off to Mickey, um, but uh, welcome back to uh, our uh, Zoom OSC, our next, our next show. Um, of course, we've been working on this. If you're, if you're watching this on YouTube, there are the last two Saturdays to watch, probably before this one. Um, we're going to be, <laughs> so you want to kind of, if you want to catch up, you can. Um, and then otherwise, if you are someone who has been working on the Zoom OSC stuff and you want to do a little show and tell, raise your digital hand. So if you're in here, Go ahead and raise your digital hand to, sit, to if you want to show off um, uh, some of the work that you've done in your homework. I'm still behind. I'll admit it. I'm still behind. I know I, I was all excited. I, I know what I want to do now, but I just haven't done it yet. So I, I, I started working through it, um, but it took me a little while to figure out what was I going to do. And now, then it, now it's taking me a little while to actually do it. So I'll, hopefully I'll have something for next week. Um, but if, yeah, if you have something you want to show, um, uh, then go ahead and put it up. Um, if you have questions, this is the good time to go to Makana and ask those questions. We'll post the, uh, we're posting the link to Makana in there if you haven't used it before. And um, we'd love to see uh, what people are doing. Um, so anyway, we'll go ahead and I'll mostly hand this off to, to Andy to run, but, I'll, but I'll, we'll go through the questions. But let's do a little, a little show and tell. And then we're going to go to the, we'll start doing questions and uh, we'll go until we run out of, run out of questions. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Alex. So, good um, to see everybody. Yep. Do you have anything? Uh, is there anything new before you uh, get before we get? Yeah, going we'll go in? through. I'll spend just a couple of quick minutes on some admin stuff about yep. what to expect, and then we'll go through the um, the examples, and then I'll do a quick primer on remote control, which is next week's subject, and then we can get into the questions if that's all right. Sounds perfect. Uh, Perfect. All right. So um, this week we released uh, 4.0.2 for Zoom OSC, um, which is an update that brought um, some additional stability on a couple of features that uh, folks were asking us for. Um, we spent a lot of time preparing for the 4.0.3 update. So that update is going to go out on Monday, most likely, and that's going to unlock a whole bunch of capabilities um, and stability across a couple of edge cases that you guys reported on. So thanks so much for the reports back on that. It's going to do a base SDK upgrade on Mac OS. So a bunch of Zoom's fixes that we provided info to are coming back at us now that We'll be able to put into the client. So um, we'll be kind of meshing that together. The other big piece of news from this morning is that uh, BitFocus merged in our, uh, our plugin. So now we are in the nightly builds of the BitFocus companion. There is one small problem. They decided to rename one of the files when they did that, and now it doesn't work. So uh, we need them to, we opened a pull request this morning, give us a couple hours, they'll, they'll fix the nightly build and uh, it'll show up again. And, and you're looking for the Zoom OSC module by Luminal. And that'll give you instance feedback, is, which is what we had talked about this week. Um, I published a couple new YouTube videos that you should check out if you haven't had a chance. Didn't get to as many as I wanted to because we were kind of focused on the software end. But um, we did cover things like the automatic titler that I've been talking about before, just to give an example of getting data out of Zoom OSC. I did a whole video on just overviewing outputs, pulling the chat messages into Isadora, making rules that say like when a when a particular participant does something, do something back at them automatically and creating these little bindings inside. We did Isadora again to lay it all out visually. And then we did a couple of um, other integrations and, and, uh, and then of course, you know, try to support the case studies as we, as we could get through them. So um, a lot of, a lot of good stuff. Um, as I said, the topic for next week is going to be um, remote controlling Zoom OSC. And to do that, you're going to need the 4.0.3 update that'll come out on Monday. So um, you can start to play with some of it you know, this weekend, but the, the, um, this is the one feature that we have, um, that we're going to cover really deeply that is marked as a beta feature. Um, we released it out there cause we know it has value in, in certain use cases, but it's something that we're still learning about the best way to do it. So, um, you'll want to check out 403 that we're trying to, uh, stabilize this a little bit more and should make things easier to use. Anyway, with, with all that said, I'd love to, I saw a lot of case studies in progress this week, which was so fun um, to see what you guys were building and all sorts of different things. So I'd love to just go through and, and take a look at what you made. And, and uh, so please, please share what you've got. Yeah. So again, if you, if you want to show a case study, if you want to talk about it, even if it's not complete and you want to show where you're at and what you're working on and, and where you're getting stumped, uh, this is a great time to raise your Zoom hand. So you raise your digital hand to say, you know, to like you see, you see Jason has his, his hand up. Um, raise your hand and, and uh, we'll uh, take a look at it. Go ahead, Jason. All right. Um, let me get the routing right. Hopefully that'll do a multi-view and it'll show um, this camera. But it just occurred to me that the routing is not working. So I, I guess I'll just have to describe it. So I've got three stream decks here and um, they're not being powered at the moment because uh, I get logged out of Zoom OSC when I'm logged into this Zoom. This is the production Zoom. Um, so suffice it to say, what I'm working on is a series of grid where if I want to mute somebody, 
I hold I'll you know I hold the mute button here and then choose who I want to mute it, it's kind of a, a, a double thing so that I've got you know input and output and then when the mute is successful the um, the button changes color but uh, I don't know why it's not powered on at the moment but yeah that's uh, that's what I'm working on and and does it uh, and the people are showing up in the in in your panel no in the same yet. order not well yes in, in the same order yes but it's at the moment it's just locked as a solid grid um, because apparently the newer version of companion is going to make this easier I was in a zoom call uh, yesterday and and saw the the pre-release version with companion and calling the update name list thing is much easier so um yeah I I, I did not tackle that instead you know I I focused most of my time on getting the function call right and and locking the grid down until the till the software is is kind of caught up with the easy way to do that. And we've created a compilation of the BitFocus Companion plugin for Linux, so that should make your life a lot easier um, when you want to deploy that. So you should you should be able to pull that from the nightly builds. That's awesome. Well, it doesn't look like anyone's ready to show anymore at the moment. Everyone's being a little timid. Uh, as far as the examples go. So if, if you do have something you want to show, go ahead and raise your uh, your Zoom hand. But let's, go, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Bill, are you there? Yeah, sure, ready. And Andy Dahl from Durham, New Hampshire says, uh, apropos of the last comment, could you give us an update on the companion plugin? I saw in Discord that you said something about there being a bug. Does that mean we should wait to install it? Yeah, just give us a, a little bit of time here. We've, we've put out the request to them to rename the module that they renamed on our behalf, <laughs> which, which broke everything and knocked over the house of cards. So uh, just give that a moment, uh, maybe a couple hours, and I'll ping Discord when it's ready again. Next Moving question. On. James in Dublin, Ireland said, did people get stuck? Where did people get stuck during the week, and what areas did they find the trickiest to navigate? Anyone? Not sure. I got stuck with time. <laughs> I got a whole bunch of things like like Andy had a bunch of, I just got a bunch of RFPs that I had to suddenly suddenly manage in a way that I didn't expect to. But uh, I'm going to be digging into it. Uh, go ahead, JJ. Go ahead. Hello. Um, so I, I ran into issues because I'm trying to be clever uh, and send the command from one device and then receive the output on another one. So I, I got stuck because I'm trying to be silly and, and, and do it differently because I'd, I'd like to have, I have Android devices. And so in having Android devices, I'd like to have one device that takes the input from OSC that it has as response information and then like the list commands and then send that, initially send the command from another device. So I think um, it's not silly at all, first of all, that's, that's a really valid use case. And in the settings menu, we split off the different uh, the receiving and ascending IPs and ports. Mm -hmm. So um, you should be able to uh, to configure that by choosing in there what you know um, where the IP for pulling in from your phone. So you know when you when you send it, if you're on a, let's say you're on LAN, right, and you've got Touch OSC and you want to talk to Zoom OSC, you'll send Touch OSC to 9090, and assuming your firewall is open, it'll show up. Now, when you um, when you want to hear back, you have to have to make sure that your firewall in the other direction is also opened up for the receiving party, whatever that application is. And that's one of the things that we saw a lot this week is that people started to stop running Zoom OSC locally and started to break it off onto other devices, but then ran into networking questions about the home network where the firewall is blocking this, or this is on a different subnet than that. And so ping test the different machines, make sure those ports are available, and then that should help you uh, be able to get those Please. talking. Yeah, and in my installation, I've got a single VLAN that, that is mm -hmm. on a, a same security zone. Uh, that's how, how 40 net deals with those security zones. Uh, but I'm also doing, try to do exactly that, try to see if I can do route leaking and multicast route leaking between two different separate VLANs so that mm -hmm. if the case does arise where someone needs to have that multicast OSC command sent over to a different VLAN where all the devices are versus the controller, that, uh, that it will do that. And in the same time, doing that with both one device as a sender and another device as a receiver. Yeah, and maybe broadcast addresses will help you with some of that. I'm, I'm, uh, it'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see what you end up Kinda. with there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, go ahead, uh, Marty. And then, and Stephen, do you have something to show? I saw your hand up. Yep. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back to you, Stephen, in a second. But go ahead, Marty. What, what are we getting stopped with? No. Nope. Okay, go ahead. Ah, oh, there we are. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't unmute. Um, 
so on a, on a lower level, I got stuck in two places. Uh, one is the inability to unmute from the stream deck or companion, because at one time when I was asked the question, if I want to allow the host to do that, I said, no. And that seems to be a permanent mark on my record. I can never allow the host to unmute me again. And I'm the host. <laughs> Um, the other, the other place I got stuck was um, uh, I'm doing two different ways of unmuting myself on my stream deck. One is a push to talk and the other is a toggle. And I was looking for a way to get feedback from Zoom on the mute state so that I can color the toggle button um, just to know Where'd you go? I think we lost you there. This picture was real dark too. I wonder if you have a problem. Yeah, well, I can say for the group that the um, the instance variables are going to be the solution to getting the state without having to actually know what it is inside of companion first. So the instance variable will tell you, hey, this per you, you, the self user is muted and that will cause the key to be a certain color if you make that little association inside a companion. Um, Steven, you had something to show? Can't hear you. Yeah, um, I, also where I'm stuck. Um, so I spent some time, uh, dug out this old Wii controller. Uh, Andy and a few other folks with a little chat going um, uh, on Slack and it was helpful, but I'm still stuck. So I can get it to, to do many things. What I was trying to do is get feedback back to this uh, via the hand raise, the idea being that as we move into a hybrid instruction situation, it'd be great to be able to free myself from being in front of a, of a screen and be able to get tactile uh, feedback when someone raises their hand and uh, playing around with osculators, just not able to find how to make an event from Zoom, Zoom OSC uh, trigger that initially. I did with the update, get some Zoom setting showing up in osculator, but hand raise is not one of them. So any thoughts, pointers, welcome. So it's it's not that you can't figure out how to get Osculator to the Wiimote to do the vibration. It's that you can't find the feedback yes. from Zoom OSC to do it. Correct. So, so example, like I said, if, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for example, I set it up for the for the home button. So pressing the home button will vibrate it, but I can't get that signal input to do the same trigger in, in Osculator. Yeah. Sure thing. So on Mac OS, the hand raising feature is a little finicky and that's because of part of the Zoom SDK. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, but I can tell you that with this merge in that we're doing on Monday, hopefully that'll resolve some of those issues. Um, it's, it, but it is a little finicky yeah, to, to detect exactly when that action occurs. Um, you might not see it in there. Uh, the other thing I'd say is just watch out just in general for the distinction between um, Zoom OSC slash user and Zoom OSC slash me. Those are two different addresses that talk about the same action, but they specify who, you know, who we're dealing with there. And so I've sometimes made this mistake myself where I've, I've tried to build something out and I've, um, I've forgotten that I am exempting myself from that. And I, when I try to trigger the action by myself, I can't see it. Um, so just, uh, it's probably not the case for you. This is probably an issue with, with raising hand, but just something to be aware of. Super cool though. I love, I love what you were showing with the, with the Wiimote. Um, Jason. Um, so I, I actually, I found myself getting stuck in um, this, you, you addressed it in one of the videos, a race condition whereby like you, um, I think your example was, you know, if host turn or if person turns off video, tell person to, to turn video back on, you know, host has asked that you turn video back on. And um, I think I started calling too many update, you know, list update list type things as part of my buttons. Um, and I guess my, my question is, when do I need to create a delay and, and when do I not? Sure. So when you're sending values, this is specific to Isadora, but when you're, when you're filling in a multi-transmit actor in Isadora, the values and the trigger need to come in at different times. Otherwise, it's unreliable when which value will get into that thing first. What you don't want to have happen is have the trigger come ahead of the 
the value propagator because that will trigger a packet with the last payload and then update the payload. So you'll be one behind as you march through. So what you want to do is you put up a little bit of trigger delay on the on the set on the whatever will activate that transmitter so that the values can get into your preset first and then you can fire off the button. That may apply in other applications too when you're trying to fill out these packets if it's if it's um, uh, sort of a node editor, but just something just something to keep in mind. Yeah. Let's go to the next question. Orion D. Slater in London says, why does the companion instance need to be in Zoom ID mode to achieve gallery tracking? Is it always going to be that case? Yes, because it doesn't. Uh, the, so the two, the two options for gallery tracking are Zoom ID and target ID. And if you went by target ID, you would not, it would not always work <laughs> because the target IDs would need to be set up. So it adds a layer of dependency to it. Um, uh, that can be a little bit tricky to deal with. When we have more time, we might go in and build out all that additional conditionals to help warn you and guide you to, you know, how to use a target ID properly with the gallery tracking inside a companion. But the the reason that Zoom IDs exist in the software is that it's always um, it's something that that has a programmatic significance. Everything else we do with with all the different ways of interacting with users, we eventually in the software convert to a Zoom ID. And then we can call the API with the Zoom ID. To keep the companion plugin from needing to do all of that converting logic, it needs to interact with the call only understanding the Zoom ID so that it can just send them back to us and we can very cleanly interpret them. So it's more of a, we needed to get this done quickly and in a way that we felt would guide users towards having success. As you can see, one of the one of the challenges with Zoom OSC is that we let you do so many different things that there's so many ways to get yourself in trouble. So we tried to we tried to reduce that a little bit by forcing you to use this exact method of Zoom IDs that we know will work every time. Uh, and the target IDs is something we'll need to spend more time thinking about how to educate users uh, to feel comfortable using. Next question. Tim Nelson in London says, "What does being in the BitFocus nightly feed mean?" Yeah, so every day BitFocus Companion releases a new version. This is common in a lot of software products that they'll have the nightly build is what it's typically called. For them, it's you know more of a daily thing. Um, but that means that every there's a there's a GitHub repo that uh, all the developers are contributing to, and every day the team behind BitFocus will compile what's on the master branch and post it for you to download. So this is a separate build of Companion. It's its own executable. Um, so back up your instances, you know, do what you have to do and launch this app separately as its own instance. And then all the features that are the most experimental are going to be available to you in a binary format. So you don't have to go build it yourself because when it's up there on GitHub, you can pull it down, you can go through the compilation steps and you can make it. But a lot of developers will just make it for you as a courtesy and you can go pull it from the nightly build section. So that's that's why. Um, we're located there. Now, in terms of how do we get into the official release? Well, that's going to depend on when BitFocus decides based on all the other variables, all the other integrators, all the things that they want to do internally, all of those things have to come together and then they feel good for a, a new official release of Companion and we'll slip into that. We don't have a timeline on that. So the best way for now to get that is to go get it from the nightly builds. Next question. Jan Landy in Las Vegas says, using OSC rather than Zoom, when I went into a meeting, I was only able to see a few people's names in the left bottom, and I was not able to rename myself. What did I do wrong? Um, so Zoom OSC has its own set of settings from the regular Zoom client. So for example, if you have, um, if you have uh, not set your gallery view from 25 to 49 in your settings, um, that could be why the, um, the number of things displayed there are different. Um, rename events, uh, that, that will depend on um, the, uh, the Zoom call and the, um, the settings for that call. So if, if, if the call is not set up to have um, non-host and co-host to rename, that can be blocking you there. There's a couple of things that are going to be Zoom specific that might be getting in your way um, that you might want to look at in the settings of that meeting. Next question. JJ McKenna, Santa Venetia, Northern California. Tips on using Touch OSC as my feedback interface. I got it working with the companion emulator. Ellipsis. Yeah. So Touch OSC is a little challenging because it's really good at one thing, which is emulating a physical button and sending that value into your network. What it's not so great at is sending lists of data or receiving data. This is where other, um, other, uh, applications are going to serve you better um, than, than Touch OSC will. Um, I, I have a couple I can show later on in the show um, to help you uh, see what the other options are. But to be completely frank, um, uh, Touch OSC 
is helpful in one very specific use case, which is the forward direction. It's not so great when you want to work in the backward direction. And Ward, do you have something to show? Yeah, I do. So let's see um, it. I, I'm more of the uh, vMix crowd. So I like you using Zoom OSC to be able to pin one or more participants, but then send those into fairly complex vMix mixes. Mm -hmm. So for instance, this past week, I was working with a, uh, a colleague who works with the UN who was speaking at an international conference. So we were doing a presentation that was a... <clears throat> was an interview format. So all I needed to do was click, use a pin command. And, and I'll show you how I do this in companion. Whoops, just happened. Yeah, we won't be able to spotlight the presenters because it'll, it'll break their well, integrations. Well, I thought I, I thought I had Alex spotlighted or pinned. So there we go, pin out. Um, and so what happens here is he can be on one screen, I can be in the other, we can be interviewing and then we can jump right over to his presentation when he starts presenting, and we can then go through slides and and do it nice and smooth. And what makes it easy is just go to the companion screen. So with companion. That is a lot of pages. I can go over and I do have a lot of pages. I work with a lot of <laughs> well different, done. different well pieces played. of hardware with it. <clears throat> but what's nice is I can go in and I can send a Zoom OSC to, uh, to pin any particular user. At the same time, I can tell vMix to send a particular input to my preview, which could be the two by two group or the, the, uh, the speaker with his PowerPoint. And then I can also tell my A10 mini if it needs to particularly change an input uh, because the A10 mini appears as only a single webcam in, uh, in vMix or on the computer, this allows me to then uh, switch inputs if I've got somebody who's on a different live camera on set. So with companion, I can be firing off all kinds of commands all at the same time and all tied to a, a single Zoom OSC uh, pin. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah, I just I find that's, sorry. I no, I love the way that you're thinking about companion and vMix together. You know, I put out that video about getting vMix to talk back to Zoom OSC directly, but it's honestly, it's, 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 it's inferior to what you're doing in a sense that if you have that additional controller, and you can send the multiple commands. It's so much more elegant to talk to both endpoints at the same time, right from the controller itself. Um, I like to have fun and play around with seeing, okay, can I get vMix to talk yeah. to this other thing and, and work through the activators? But that's the, I mean, that is totally the recommendation, you know, is, is to have that dedicated controller that is sending multiple actions, multiple pieces of software and getting them to work together. Cause that's, that's really what OSC is for, you know, and that's what, that's what, um, uh, so that was, that was great. I was so happy to see what you had shared in the showcases. And that was Thank great. you. And it saves me a liminal license at the moment. Too. <laughs> there you go. There you or, go. Uh, or, yeah. And do you think they have a very light graphics overlay over you on your feed? Yeah, this is, so I need to change my renderer because this is a zoom bug that we've been having on my computer. So I'm going to switch over to uh, DirectX or something. Uh, next question. Okay, Jan Landy's in next with, I am totally confused on how I can test out my spotlight slash um, unmute highlight a panelist commands work on multiple panelists when I'm the only one in the meeting. Let me see here. So oh, go ahead, Benjamin. Oh, yeah. oh no, go ahead, please. Zoom mute. Uh, so I have posted recently a, a script to do exactly this. Uh, I can reshare it at the end of today's class. And essentially, just it automatically creates a whole bunch of uh, instances of the Zoom uh, OSC client so that you can create as many uh, test clients as you want. So uh, an easy example, let's say you really want to test your spotlighting and pinning, you can create five or 20 clients, however many you want, and then you have some extra users to play around with. Don't use it for nefarious purposes. <laughs> 
point. Andy, did you want to add anything to that? No, that's great. Yeah, we we support these um, these arguments that you can send via the command line, and and so those scripts allow you to basically utilize all those capabilities and and build out a bunch of virtual participants. The only other thing I'll say is that we're working with a guy um, named Felipe Nardi, and he I've talked about him a lot before because he he works with us in the Magicians Network, and what he's done is he's created a perpetual Zoom meeting with 25 participants in it that are all instances of Zoom OSC. So on the back end, there's a little engine running that's resetting the room every 10 minutes so that you can go in and you can raise a hand to get co-host permissions and things like that. And all of it's automated and it's completely, you know, there's nobody needing there to manage that space. And he uses that for his, uh, uh, his Maestro platform to, to test things with his customers. And he's going to open it up a little more broadly so that we can test things out there. That's great. Uh, Beijing? Yeah, I just had a question related to this. I was trying to use the script today for some testing. And I seemed, I don't know whether it was a user error on my end that when I was trying to start a join a meeting where I had specifically said that you don't need to be authenticated to join, it still kept on giving me an error that the password was incorrect. But when I logged in to Zoom OSC with an account and then tried to join the meeting, it joined correctly. But without logging into it, it didn't uh, let me join that meeting. Yeah, I think that the script is... Uh... This may be intentional. <laughs> um, this is this is a I think a security feature. Um, this is to prevent um, uh, multiple logins through a logged in account that we don't cache that. So um, if it requires registration, that is the reason that meetings require registration. Right, is to prevent unauthorized access. And so we are we're trying to respect that feature by not allowing you to join meetings that require authentication via the script. Um, so you can only use the only join method. No, but that's what I'm saying. I was trying to mm. use only join basically. And I had actually created that meeting without requiring. Oh, without requiring it. Okay. I, that's peculiar I, then. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I'm not sure we'd have to look at the script and figure out what's going yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, Michael, Michael, you have something to show? No, I didn't have anything to show. I just, uh, I noticed here on Makana and I asked the same thing is where is that, uh, uh, that script that you set up available, Benjamin? It looks like several of us want to know. Yeah, I think he's going to post it there. Uh, just just to define the nomenclature, uh, when you raise the Zoom hand, that'll be, I want to show something. If you raise your physical hand, that'll be a, I have something to add to the specific question. Um, it's, it's pretty specific to us. Uh, next question. Okay, and Andy Leak, right now, I just know a lot of people are going to be coming for this information, so I didn't want to have anything overlaying you. Uh, Jan Landy in Las Vegas asks, using OSC, why can I only see the 25 people on the first screen? Yeah, so this is, again, the fact that Zoom OSC's settings bay is different from your Zoom settings bay. So when you go into your, um, your settings there, you should be able to set it to 49, and then you should be able to see 49 participants. Um, go ahead, Jan. Oh, you're a lot muted. quieter than we expected. No, oh, okay. Okay, now I can, because uh, you haven't muted so much control, I, I'm freaking out no, over here. But going. anyway, I, I asked a question uh, to you earlier. And when I was on using Zoom, Zoom, uh, your, your Zoom program, I was able to be in the room and I was only able to see two people's names in the left-hand corner. And I couldn't even rename myself, which was really strange. So everyone everybody's in other words, everybody had themselves named, but I could only see two people. I couldn't even see the host's name. And so I thought that was kind of strange that I couldn't even rename myself. And mm. that's why I was saying, what did I do wrong? Cause I know that the host didn't have that locked. Uh, Michael was in the room too. I don't know if he noticed it as well. Michael Frawley was in the room at the same time. Hmm. Um, it could be a rendering thing. I mean, it could be that, you know, if there's, I know that the um, the Zoom SDK app doesn't do so well under scaling. Like if it's if there's a strange, not a strange, but just a non-standard monitor resolution, some of the UI elements will kind of glitch out and they won't look right. Um, I haven't personally encountered that. Uh, this is the first I've I've heard of it, so I'd have to look into it a little bit more. But um, you should have, yeah, you should have all of the participants panel rendering properly in the names there, and you should be able to interact with them as you know as intended. Let's move on to the next question. Andy Dolph in Durham, New Hampshire says, Andy, could you give us an update on Zoom ISO and when we might get to play with it if you have an idea of the cost and if you have an idea of the cost model? So the here's where I'm at with Zoom ISO. So I have a working beta of it that I've shown in a couple of different places, um, but I want to do more. I know, and the way I need to do more is there's this little switch. Let's imagine this. I, can't, I have to be careful about how I explain this, but there's a little switch that Zoom has. 
and they can give every developer, they can turn the switch on or off. And for many developers, they turn that switch on. For us, they haven't done it yet. When they turn that switch on, in a week, I can have a working beta for you. Um, but I need them to flip the switch. And they have told me that they are um, uh, and it's sort of indefinite. Like, I don't, we don't know when we can turn the switch up. We don't know when we can do it. And I'm like, I really need it. There's a lot of people who really want to use this thing. But, uh, uh, so I'm trying to play that game with them. But as soon as they is flip there, that switch, I'm good. Is there anywhere online that we can apply pressure? I will think about that and I will get back to you. But uh, I would be appreciated. I just have to think of the, the polite way of doing that. <laughs> there's a bunch of us that we'll do it nicely. But if, if there's a place where we can make a feature request in mass, just let us know. Um, we'll I just do. don't know if the if the standard uh, feedback thing will make any sense because I don't think it'll go to people that would have any part of that. But um, let us know. Um, we'll do. Next question. Assemble the brigade. Andy Dolphin, Durham, New Hampshire is. Oh, I'm sorry, that was the last one. Cara Negre here of Gainesville, Florida. I will be managing a meeting with different attendees. 196 on screen. There will be four laptops running the event. The goal: four distinct video outputs with a different 49 attendees on each output with distributed responsibility. Is the best approach one Zoom OSC instance per laptop? So you need to have different pages. Is what I understand correctly, it's different pages of the gallery view that you need to pull in. Um, we don't give you pagination control just yet. It's something we can we can add. Um, so we wouldn't be able to like um, have you programmatically switch between those views. Now, if you needed four individuals though, or you needed the ability to switch between. Yeah, I think I think yeah. what she wants to do is put up four screens with four computers. I think the question is: is does she need to do? And I don't know if Kara is still here. That's but correct. She... No, I'm here. So I'll be, I'll oh, be your proxy. So yeah, yep. so there's four different, so we want 196 attendees mm -hmm. and we want to manage 49 unique individuals per laptop using Zoom OSC. So we've got four helpers mm -hmm. so that we can literally have a, a video wall with four screens, each driven by each laptop. So each of the, so 196 unique attendees in that video wall. Uh, so four different laptops, if we could somehow control the 49 in the gallery view. So I got four unique gallery views of the same meeting with four unique individuals using Zoom OSC to control either a pin or a spotlight for that one output. So breaking up a, a 196 person meeting into four distinct people people's Yeah, so you should, so you can do, if, if it's about, um, uh, switching between those panels, then yes, that, that, you know, that's the, where the pin and spotlight comes in. And that's where you can, I mean, you can even in theory, you can do this from a single controller, right? You could have it talk to via OSC over your network to all the computers and have different buttons that have different IP addresses that they're talking to instead of companion. And then you would have just one human, you know, versus four, which is, you know, the power is that it can cut down a lot on the manned operation of these machines um, by having a central controller. We saw, we had somebody in, uh, in India create a, um, they did a medical conference and they had like 15 laptops, all these different presenters, and they had one stream deck and they were just pulling in talent, multi-views, all that stuff. Um, and it was, it was really impressive, um, but it was all done from a single stream deck. So it can totally be done. So, to build on that, theoretically, I could set up. What's how does it? How do you talk to Unreal Engine? Oh yeah, uh, I did a test with Unreal Engine uh, last weekend. So um, there's a, there's Live Link in Unreal, which is uh, a, a bridge for protocols, including OSC. Um, so you can send and receive OSC from Unreal Engine, and then of course you can do NDI into Unreal Engine or any host of ways of, of video ingest. So let's say you wanted to have a uh, oh, we the joke that we've done internally is we want to take a zoom call and put the Niagara engine on it, <laughs> just like break it apart and shatter it or something like that. So the way you do that is you'd pull in, let's just say NDI into unreal engine, you texture your model with it. Okay. Now you got the call in there. Now you want to be able to have um, awareness of particular participants. So you can get their gallery index. You can get their username, whatever, whatever interfacing method you need. You could have unreal engine, go to zoom OSC via the live link. And then Zoom OSC could respond to you with the piece of information you need to trigger your effect or whatever it is. Um, and then live once it's, once it gets back through Live Link, you could say, okay, I got this OSC message. Now I'm going to do this action, and it's going to trigger this Niagara effect on this video wall or something like that. So there there is total interop between the two. I mean, the, the, the specifically to what I'm thinking about is, let's say I put eight computers in there, mm -hmm. and I've got um, 
300 and some people, you know, that are available to me. Um, they're coming in, we'll just say eight inputs, m maybe NDI, but we could do SDI. Mm -hmm. You know, just the computers are going out, they're coming into an 8K board, you know, black magic board is different feeds. Then I have, um, I take all of the, I have a set output. So I take all the windows and I map them onto polygons. So I just have each, each person is mapped onto a polygon. Um, but when I say I want to, so then I essentially have complete control over the size, shape, everything of every person in the, in the group. Um, when someone speaks and I say, let me talk to you, it swaps that computer to, you know, um, a spotlight or pin or whatever, a pin of that person just as it, just before it zooms up. So it has to, so it has to tell Zumo, Zumo OC says, okay, I'm going to switch to pin. Then when I give it a sec, you know, give it 200 milliseconds and then start the zoom up so that it, when it zooms from that polygon, it's replaced the grid version of it at 240 by whatever to the 1080p version as it scales up so that you don't see any softness. It just appears yeah. like it'll, it'll snap as a small one, but if we just don't cut to it, then it would, so on a screen and it would just be 49 people per computer, we'll just say, I mean, theoretically, you probably do it with one computer for a couple of different things, but you could end up with a lot of people and be able to interactively just bring up whoever you want and they're going to zoom up and you could even have it where the, the grid kind of moves out of the way. You know, kind of yeah. Go, it does something organic. Yeah, it breaks and apart. And it's all sitting in 3d. Yeah. It's all polygons sitting in 3d spaces. So what you can totally do this. And the way that you would want to do this is I'd have one laptop that was providing the gallery view that's used to get those low res polygon feeds. And then I'd have a second laptop that was designed for the one up. And what you can do is zoom. So you wouldn't do it with the same lap. You wouldn't do it with the same output for that. Because I would, I, the way I would aesthetically think of it is I'd like to have the gallery feeds up there all the time, you know, just available mm -hmm. to me if I ever need to go to it. And then I could make multi mixes of like some periphery of polygons featuring the center person in the middle. And I wouldn't right. have to, I wouldn't have to choose. So the other thing I would do is, you know, in Unreal Engine, you're going to think about like, you, you don't necessarily need us to figure out, you know, um, how to get the videos onto the polygons. Like that's figured out and known. What you can't do without us is figure out who is on that polygon. Oh, no, that's, no, right? absolutely. And that's, and that's the thing. So you would want to have this association between the virtual camera, knowing where to go to out of your polygon wall. And then when you feature that person, you need to be able to call them up programmatically to get the high HD feed, like you say, and know which polygon you have to call it on based on which person is talking. So that identity association is what we do. And that's, and that will be really yep. helpful for that. Yeah, go ahead, Beju. Uh, Andy, going back to the original question from Kara, the question I had was thinking about that was like, if it's one meeting, like if you had four separate meetings of 49, you know, you have a fixed gallery view, mm -hmm. but if you have four machines logged into the same meeting with, 196 people and you want to have separate pages on each of the machines and make sure you're not getting duplicates. How would you do that? Basically to make sure that each of the four machines, when they're on different pages of the meeting are showing different people, they're not showing the same people, people aren't being repeated. So is there a way to sync that up? Would it using something like target lists or something else? Uh, that could help. Uh, Benjamin, do you want to jump on part of that? Benjamin. Uh, I'm just thinking if you have one, if you had your host move one person around just a little bit, and then you do follow host view, you'll get the same gallery view across all of them. So then you can make sure you're not repeating people. Yeah, exactly. So you, once you force it, because like it, it, you're totally right, Beju, that it's going to be totally randomized when they first log in and you're going to be like, okay, how do I have any idea? Now we can tell you who you have, but we can't like give you who you don't have, right? Like we can't, we can't change that gallery view yet for you. Um, but uh, uh, if you lock it in, and then, then you can use the gallery feedback and you can have a checksum, you know, that's sitting there. It's like, all right, this is the gallery order from this computer. This is the gallery order from this computer. Do they have any intersection? And you could programmatically build, you know, something in the back end. And I'll show you a little bit about this in universe control here when we get through some of these. And then I'll show you a little bit about what people are doing with it, but it, that would be totally possible. Then we definitely need the page controls. <laughs> yes, you do need the page controls and we will, we will try to build those out. Yeah. Uh, next question. Ray Harris in Houston says, Zoom OSC, how do I get a text from an attendee chat to trigger an event using Isadora? I can see the chat information in the multi-listener. Yes, so I have a YouTube video on this and, it, and all I showed in that video was how to draw the text on screen. But there is um, a text comparison and that you can do in Isadora that says, uh, and you can see that 
you can see the text comparison inside of my YouTube video on lower thirds, because that's how I prevent it from re-triggering itself as I see if it, the name is new. So you can use the same logic from that video and combine that with the other YouTube video about pulling in the chat and figure out if the text is equal to something, do something on screen. We use this in trivia games. Uh, the L created something that was um, like, you put the questions on screen, and then if the, if the student wrote back the correct answer, um, it would spotlight them and there'd be something like, you got it correct, that would show up in the chat. And the way it worked was when they chatted the answer, it would look at the, it would try to compare the answer that it got to the known correct answer for that part of the trivia game. And if they were equal, it would grab the Zoom ID from the chat person and go spotlight them. So you can build this out for sure. You just need to, you just need to start using logical comparisons inside of Isadora. Next question. Moving on, Ray Harris is next from Houston, Texas. And Ray says, uh, what's the best way to remember who to pick in the user versus me for dummies? Who to pick in the user versus me. So I, I imagine this is because you're talking about the output system here and you wanna know when an OSC message is going to be based on user or on self. So the me command will report any user action in, with respect to yourself. And uh, so, if, for example, if I mute my 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 uh, my audio, I will get a message in Zoom OSC that's Zoom OSC slash me slash mute or something like that. And um, there won't be, and then there'll be the user prefix. Uh, so, if you want to filter out all of your self-identifying information, you just subscribe to Zoom OSC slash user slash action, and that's that's going to be how you roll ninety-five percent of the time. You'd never really need to be aware of of your self actions because presumably you're triggering those. So you already have an alternate method of getting that information, but we give it there as a, as a filter basically to be able to do something else. Next question. Moving on to teach. Uh, I'm sorry. I, Ar I, Ar I have, I have one, one, one quick question, Andy. Oh, sure. Are you able to unmute someone's video through Zoom OSC? Yes. So this is, we'll talk about remote control in a sec. Uh, maybe, uh, um, but the, the way that, um, the way that it works is obviously there's a consent system. You know, you can request mm -hmm. somebody's video on. To actually turn it on, there's two ways you can do it. Any Zoom OSC instance that gets a request will accept the request automatically. So right. if you deploy it on the far end, you can get that control. Now you can also use the remote control system to be able to, you know, change their camera and mic levels mm -hmm. and things like that. But but at most simple, any version of Zoom OSC will automatically accept requests that come into it. The reason we feel comfortable doing that is because it's presumably being specially deployed for a production purpose, not for right. general. So, yeah. There you go. Next question. TJ Asher is up from Minneapolis, Minnesota, saying, "Andy, do you have any control over the Zoom interface at all, or is it that, in, or is that entirely under the control of Zoom?" Wondering if you could find the interface, oh, tint the interface red when my mic is open, and tint it green when it's closed. Also, want window positions to save. Yeah. So. Um, that is not unfortunately in our control. That that UI is all sort of handled by them. On Mac OS, we have a little more flexibility than we do on Windows. We have absolutely no control on Windows of anything that's interface related. On Mac OS, we can sort of uh, peek behind the curtain a little bit more. I don't know how much we could modify. There are other applications though. So you can make a Zoom custom UI application and those applications have uh, the ability to do modifications and things like that. But Zoom OSC is not one of them. Zoom OSC inherits from the vanilla Zoom client. So it's familiar to use. Um, but something like Zoom ISO will be a custom UI application. Next question. Moving on to Andy Kenturik of Carol Stream, Illinois says, will you send Zoom OSC homework links again? Yes, I will. Uh, usually that goes out late on Sunday. Uh, and that'll, that'll be a document that gives you um, the next topic, which is remote control, which we can, if we, at some point we find a pause and we want to talk about that, um, we, can, we can go into some details and to prime you for that. Uh, but we'll give you that information. We'll give you some targets to try to hit uh, for the following Saturday. And then there'll be some new YouTube videos that'll go up to try to support you getting through that. Next question. Barry Williams in London in the UK says, I found the code examples that Andy put in the chats were very helpful. Would it be possible to add a few more code examples to the API document, please? It would really help avoiding multiple syntax errors. Yeah, so I can do... Um, if we if it's if it's helpful, we can do another example sheet of of commands and basically list the command and what it does. Um, we could do that either as a as a file or we could do that in a YouTube video. Um, uh, so let me know what would be most helpful. You know, reach out in Discord. I'm I'm actively asking the Discord. You know, what what do you need to see? 
um, in order to like, what, what should I make a video on tonight? And, and if that's, if that's it, then I will definitely, I'll definitely do that. If you need it written out though, and you need a sheet, that's just like 15 commands and what they do happily will do that. Next question. David Brady in New York says, are there any plans for a Zoom room like build of Zoom OSC? Note a non-sentient appliance like instance. <laughs> um, so there's no, there's no um, native SDK for Zoom rooms. However, as you know, Zoom meetings and Zoom rooms can work together. Um, so what I need to do is I need to set aside some time and do some tests and see what kind of how, do, how, how can you capitalize on that synergy between the meeting client and the room client? There also is a, a rooms API and uh, provided that I have more time, I might be able to look at making something for that. Um, it's just a question of how many bases can we cover while keeping a quality product. Next question. Okay, Andrew Lipnick of San Francisco says, when using separate Zoom calls as individual pipes to bring single presenters into an event workflow, in Companion, do you need to create different instances of OSC for each of those Zoom calls in order to have separate control of those presenters? Yes. So for every machine that you want to interact with, you should create a Zoom, you should create an OSC instance and then set that instance to use the IP address of the computer that you're trying to talk to that way. And then when you go to build out your buttons, you just call up the instance for the computer that you're trying to interact with. And that'll be, you know, that'll be how you do it. So whether it's, you know, a bunch of stream decks, each, you know, configured for each computer, whether it's buttons that specify on the name, like this is going to, you know, pull up pin one on computer one, and then it's got, you know, the instance for computer one. But yeah, you want to make one instance. That's the way that you distinguish IP addresses for OSC and companion. Good, Benjamin. Um, I'll just put it out there real quick. I've had some good success with uh, running multiple instances of Zoom OSC on one uh, computer and then just targeting different port numbers. Um, so like if you want to build an AV switcher, for example, like with just a, a preview program situation, you could have two uh, instances of Zoom OSC running with different port numbers uh, with make sure you have different transmit and receive ports. Um, and you can do two instances in companion. That tends to work out. Yep. Great. Next question. Jason Bates is in with, under which circumstances would I have a second system joined into a meeting webinar with Zoom OSC independently from myself in the meeting? Under which circumstances should I just be participating in the meeting through Zoom OSC on my main machine? I get stuck understanding the merits of each mode. Yeah, totally. So there's, um, I think there's situations for both. I typically will uh, have my AV contribution be through a vanilla Zoom client, and I'll have Zoom OSC there as you know as a little sidecar that I can interact with on its own. Um, it's the funny thing is I used to do this even before Zoom OSC, right? I used to have if I had an event and I wanted to have myself contributing and participating in the meeting, I would have a different computer for me to participate with Zoom if I needed to be able to talk to people, interact with people, and then a different machine that was the workhorse where I was going through and optimizing my view for you know being able to hunt and do things that I need to do to get the job done. So in, in a sense, that, that hasn't really changed for me, but that's also just a personal opinion. The reason that you might want to use Zoom OSC as your contribution system is that you can get access to, um, uh, and John was showing this last week, but you can get access to a lot of um, uh, options, you know, for self-management. You know, if you want to be able to adjust your mic with a stream deck, right? Uh, that is something that you can only do with a Zoom OSC client and be able to, you know, go up and down um, in terms of the, the levels on your microphone without having to go into the settings menu and find that. Same with the screen share, right? I published a video on quick screen sharing by making Stream Deck buttons for every monitor and just holding it while I want to share and releasing it to, and that, that only works if that's the way that you're participating into the Zoom meeting. Otherwise it doesn't really make sense, you know? So I think it's about, it's about what you're trying to do. Um, I'd say that, uh, you know, especially in, in production scenarios, I always will duplicate. But for, um, for the more casual stuff where I just want to have a, a, a good interface to Zoom um, for my own management of the meeting, then yeah, I'll just join for self-contribution. Next question. Dick Brewer in Guatemala asks, I'm observing a change in color of encryption shield, top left corner to orange. How is one client an, ex an encryption exception? I do not know that. If it's a Zoom OSC, is it when Zoom OSC joins that it sets it to a different color? I know that it has to, maybe it's because of the stream. I don't know. There's a bunch of hands. Maybe someone has a perspective on that. Go ahead, Mickey. 
Yeah, we have uh, one person joining in uh, via phone, and that's uh, what is causing the the warning that it's an encrypted connection. <laughs> there we go. Uh, next question. Rogue phone calls. Orion Z. Slater in London is back with, is there a way to change the Zoom OSC meeting window somehow to make it distinct from the vanilla client? I keep getting confused, which I'm clicking on when I have them both open in a meeting. Yeah, so the, I mean, we changed... Um, as much as we could change, we changed the badge and we changed the name. Now we did get a request from one of our, um, uh, somebody who was asking about enterprise options to be able to um, use a command line option to actually set the name of the window so that they could in um, their scan converters figure out if they had multiple instances going, which one was which. And they wanted to be able to do that dynamically. Um, and uh, they attempted to, it, they attempted to hack Zoom OSC to do it, and then it, it broke they're the validation. The hack? Yeah, they're hacking the hack, right? And, the, and then it, it broke the validation on it. And they got sad, so they emailed us, and we're like, "Yeah, we'll just we'll just add that. <laughs> like, you don't you don't you don't have to fight us. Like, we'll just we'll just do it. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> we'll great. take care. Of it. So we'll we'll add that soon. That's awesome. Uh, next question. Our own Benjamin Antiput here in the panel from San Carlos, California, says with the current and beta companion module, Zoom OSC is not connecting and the old button actions do not part over, port over without code name, without some name switching. After the update today, should the experimental build run with 4.0.2? Right. So the, um, so we're talking about the instance versus the plugin, right? So the, 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 um, the old com dot companion config three was for 3.0.2 and that would not work with anything that was for and later um, because the syntax has changed. The, the commands that's burned into the buttons are different. Now, as I showed last week, it's very easy to update those and get those up to speed. So, but I, last week I just did it. So now on our website, when you go to our, our resources page, there's a, there's a companion config for the, um, for Zoom OSC 4.0.2 and later. So when you download that, that's basically the same thing as we used to have but it's updated for the syntax for the latest um, Zoom OSC version. Now the, um, the, the, excuse me, the instance for Zoom OSC is set up for four from the ground up and it'll only work with four. So all of the instance variables and things will come back and that, that should work for that only. Uh, not, that w excellent answer, but not quite my question. Um, oh, sorry. The, <laughs> that's all good. Uh, the, I was wondering because the latest experimental build that you posted that was posted this morning or mm -hmm. last night, um, does not appear to interface properly with 4.0.2 in my testing? Mm. Uh, um, it's probably because of the, the config name. Oh, no. Are you talking? Sorry. I, re I renamed all my configs. Mm. Um, so I'll, we can continue. We'll, this have, we'll, have to, we'll have to talk with yeah. Ashley Green about that because um, th that I'm not familiar with. Okay. Next question. Tadlock Lopez Waterman from New York is in with when using the target list, is it okay to make changes to that file repeatedly or is it more thought of as a file that is written and then stays throughout the meeting? You should be able to change that as often as you wish. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's there for you as a, as a resource and you can sort of use it as, as you see fit. The, um, the reasons not to change it are when you change it, you're changing your bindings. So if you're, uh, I wouldn't change it and then not like I wouldn't I wouldn't casually change it in preparation for something and then load it while I'm in the middle of something. Right. Because that would that would throw off your key bindings. But just as so long as you're intentional about when you're changing it, there's no there's no harm to the software about when you load it up. It doesn't it doesn't really care. Next question. Brian Henry of Boulder City asks, I have a meeting coming up using OBS as a switching interface. One of the panel views will have the primary presenter larger with two smaller thumbnails of the other presenters. What would be the best way using Zoom OSC to swap presenters and move them from the small window to the large window and so forth? Go check out Joe Shea's collection of resources. Um, these are, uh, so Joe Shea's a, a, a fellow out of USC and he um, creates a a uh, small army of tools that are designed specifically for this. So what he's done is he's taken Touch OSC, QLab, OBS, and Zoom OSC, and he's created his own application that interfaces all of them together with a user interface that just abstracts everything that's happening in the back end. So he can do things like take out his iPad and call up some presenters and place them in a view on screen and then save that as a scene and then build a new scene. So it's, it's extremely efficient. The only catch is it's not updated for version four yet. So you need to roll back to 3.2.1 until Joe gets his integration updated to version four. And where do we find Joe Shea? Uh, on GitHub, I'll put something in Mokana. Okay, great.
All right, next question. Andy Dolph of Durham, North New Hampshire, says, what applications are folks using to work with data coming out of Zoom OSC other than Isadora? Does anyone want to take a stab at that? I can give some answers to, but. Um... Uh, no, uh, go ahead. Uh, oh, Leland, go ahead. I think he's more referring to what we're using to put into Zoom OSC, which would be a control software or service. Um, I'm using OSC Pilot once we can get some of those folks to update the process in which it accepts OSC commands. And I could probably answer because I'm going to have to bail real quick. There's a question that dropped about whether we got the volume sliders to work. So no, not until we actually get the developer to update that software. And Ward, did you have something to show? Oh, you're quiet. There we go. Um, I just wanted to add something to the last question about OBS. Um, all he needs to do is design three scenes and switch between the scenes and change the layout of the various uh, people in the scene, just like vMix. Uh, and then all agree. you have to do is switch between scenes. I, I agree. I think the only, um, the only thing that the question might have been hinting to, I don't know if this is the case, but it might be the case that what he wants to have this this automatic changing of who is the the pinned user when he switches those scenes, and to do that he'll need that talkback line between um, uh, OBS and Zoom OSC to call up the right person for that scene to feature them large, and then ensure that the others are in the other locations to grab them from. Not if he's using Companion and he's got a in the different user as the first Companion to switch scene in OBS as the second command. Right. And yeah, and if he's using Companion, it switches your pins. Yeah. yeah, if he's using companion, that's 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 a great solution too, to to do them both at once, just like you did with vMix, essentially, right? The same, it's the same question about whether you want to have the software talk to each other, or do you have one controller talk to multiple pieces of software? I think you're totally right. That's a valid that's a valid idea. If, if companion is an option for them, which it should be for everybody, um, I'll show you guys real quick a uh, another application that I came across this week. I'm actually talking to the developer of this application now. This is Universe Control. Um, Universe Control is awesome. It's a little expensive, but holy cow, it has unlimited like OSC processing options. So this is um, uh, Sherman's um, showcase from this week. Sherman wasn't able to join us today, but asked me to present this on his behalf. Um, what he's got here is basically the ability to do, um, he can pull in NDI from both of his Zoom monitors. And then he has all of these different options where he can select an action on the left panel and a participant on the right panel. And these fields can automatically update and, and he can do all sorts of global actions and user actions and and this is a bi-directional OSC interface that was extremely powerful. Um, other apps that can pull in OSC, Osculator, you know, is one of them that allows you to go between MIDI and keyboard presses to OSC as well. You can do on Windows, there's OSC Matrix for that MIDI migration between OSC and MIDI. And then there's OSC Key Press, which I showed a video on when I um, uh, challenged Alex to rebuild what I built better inside of Keynote, which was uh, advancing a, a slide presentation when somebody raises their hand. And playing that animation into vmix um, that video was basically that it was it was osc key press pulling in the action from the osc output turning it into a keyboard action and causing something to happen inside of powerpoint the, the i'm just i got a little lost in the universe they, they, so they got a little nodal nodal workflow system yeah, they do. And it's, so this is, so it's a node editor that is used to build an interface and it has, it has interfaces with the stream deck. I mean, the more I look at this thing, the more I realize just how explosive the possibilities are. And so I reached out to the developers of this application to ask them if they wanted to talk uh, because we could build something extremely dangerous in, in that environment. Uh, it's basically Isadora, but it takes away all the things that you don't need from Isadora and optimizes them for control surfaces. But again, it's a little expensive. So we'll have to see what we can do, but yeah. yeah. That's really cool. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I was as a Mac user, I was like, oh, it's only on Windows. But I was like, wow, that's it feels very when you look at it, it feels very Mac like and it's just just not that. And and uh but it's it's uh it's pretty cool, James. Up oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh what what was that called again, Andy? I missed that part. Uh universe control. Um, it's universe dash control dot com is what you're looking for. Let them know, uh, please, like this is like the best way to get to get these integrations out there. Like when you're like, oh, I wish Sumo OSC had a really direct way of working with that, mob them. Just like ask them uh, to okay, integrate so it, right? <laughs> like, here, I will, uh, hold on. Assemble the <laughs> let's, brigade. Let's, 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 let's have an experiment. Um, so I, we will now, we'll, we'll do this live. Um, we are going to push this into Makana. 
uh, did someone put, I'm going to put the direct link to their support. Oh, okay. Yeah. Leland already put it in universe-control.com slash support. We're all going to take a moment now and uh, we're going to click on the get in touch and we're going to put our uh, name and address. Uh, is it a feature request? Yeah, it would be a feature request for a Zoom OSC integration. Make it Zoom OSC. Uh, I would love for this to be this product uh, to be more integrated with Zoom OSC and would probably buy it as a result. <laughs> There you go. Yep. That's 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 hitting it right there. I'm not a robot. I don't say it the same way I said it, but say something like that. All right. So and and we have to remember that the reason that Andy showed up here was because 70 people did something on one day, right? So right. it you know, especially in a nascent market like this right now, if everybody here there's 112 of us in Zoom and there's another 20 or 30 that are watching somewhere else and other people listening. If half of us or all of us all make that request right now, uh, we might we might actually, we'll see how fast it moves. And Andy can tell us next week if any if they noticed anything or if they mentioned anything like, wow, a whole bunch of people just asked for something. Uh, go ahead, JJ. Yes. You're much quieter than we expected. You're muted. Six, seven, one, two, six, seven. There we go. So, so this is why <laughs> when people ask why I still click on the microphone instead of doing anything else, it's, it's these moments. It's these Those moments people had the happen. lamest CAPTCHA I've ever seen. It, there was there nothing we, uh, in there. Well, I'm glad. Oh, I hate CAPTCHA. Uh, anyway, uh, Benjamin, go ahead. Oh, see, now we're waiting for Benjamin to unmute. <laughs> uh, I just want to point out that we started at ticket 112. We ended at at least ticket 179. So we succeeded. <laughs> That's very good. Uh, go ahead, David. Uh, oh. Okay, there we go. Um, there are three versions up there. Will all three work the same? What was used for that example? Do you know? So the standard version is used in the example that I showed you, but the standard version... Um, I think I think there's probably a way, and this might be to their advantage, that we could tier it as they you know, as they build up the tiers and they have more features in their platform. We could integrate more features of Zoom OSC that are designed to work well with those new features that you unlock as you move up their up their category. That's what we did with Maestro, um, and that worked really really well because we give you this whole sampling of things, but there's nothing that says that like you know if this certain version of Maestro, for example, has a has a feature that would work really well with multi pinning. Well, then we can just make the pro tie in with that, and we're also like super open to customizing this application to work with other tiers of things. Like if we need to have some features, you know, that work in a slightly different way, like we'll make the change. Like we're not set in stone. Like we'll, just as long as we don't deprecate a use case for somebody in the service of opening up an integration, we'll add new things to kingdom come. If that helps new people use the application. So no worries there at all. Uh, next question. Uh, Andy Dolph. Other than store, no, that's the last one. I'm sorry, I was a little confused there for a second. Uh, Devin Gee in Santa Barbara says, with Zoom OSC on both sides, I was specifically having trouble unmuting a PC user. I was able to mute them and turn on and off their video without them having to accept the request, but the unmute function still required them to unmute themselves by accepting the request. Interesting. Um, the uh, okay, so I I. Suspect that the reason for that is fixed in 403, but let me know if you try the Monday update and it doesn't work. Again, yeah, the remote control is is uh, kind of experimental in that sense. Um, there's some things that we have to iron out to get it really smooth because um, it's using chat <laughs> like as a back channel. It's not, you know, like and um, I'll uh, I definitely need to remember before we end today's session to spend a couple of minutes talking about remote control, but um, that uh, I'll talk more about that then. Next question. Moving on to John D. Pruitt's question from Huntersville, North Carolina. OSC culator or OS cal OS osculator? Hmm. Never saw the OSC response from Zoom OSC. I thought I had the right port. Any thoughts? Oh, you well, had the right port. Yeah, double check that um, that you've got the 
sending port from Zoom OSC going into the receiving port for Osculator. Um, that'd be step one, I think. Um, and then make sure that you have your subscription level set to whatever, like all or whatever it is that you're trying to. Because remember, with, with with if subscribe is off, you get nothing. <laughs> you know, you get nothing, right? Uh, you get nothing from Zoom OSC um, uh, about any users because you haven't subscribed to them. But when you set the subscription level up a tier, that should help you there. Fred Tucker. The unmute. Sorry. So a note, a note on the unmute is that uh, what's happening whenever it's delayed like that is that I've got to wait for a request to come from whoever's managing that, and that's what that delay is coming from. That's why I want to build a little thing that lets you when somebody raises their hand, right, inside just, of you know, it, it presents you with the option to do an action with them, right? Yeah, you can do that in about five minutes of Isadora programming. So um, oh, wait, so wait, you're waiting for it being. Uh, we have to approve you. You have to. Well, not yeah, even. Not I, even I've approving. Been, he's got to actually send. Yeah. Yep. Got it. Okay. So that's so that, that delay. Looks... So yeah, it's. Um, okay. But in any case, that's not what. It, so, um, depending on the application, a lot of times only one application can grab hold of a single uh, port. So pay attention that you only have one application listening to a specific port whenever you're trying to monitor. Um, so just just a heads up on why you may not see something in your OSC reader. Uh, so like if you're testing, if you're running a test where you're like running companion to, to Zoom OSC, you need to offset one port when you're doing your testing, like move your companion config up one port and listen on that raised port when you're doing tests. Because if you're, if you have the application listening, it ties up the port anyways. All right, go ahead, Leland. Yeah, and that, with regards to ports, I was curious what you guys recommend for a receiving port when you're doing feedback. I see on the defaults we have 9090 for a send port and 1234 is a receive port, but what would you guys recommend people use normally or what to avoid for sure and make sure we don't use the wrong port? Go ahead, Tucker. So uh, potentially there's a, a huge number of ports that are in use by your operating system already. Um, typically if you're going to move off of the ports that Andy has set up, then go up in the like 9,000 range, uh, between 9,000 and 10,000, you're usually in great shape, but high values are good. The reason it defaults to one, two, three, four is that it works with Isadora out of the box. Um, so we got to, we got to pick an integrator <laughs> and Isadora has been good to us. So we let them have theirs work implicitly without any settings changes. Go ahead, Jason. Oop. I would be just very careful about about messing with that port unnecessarily. It's just a bad idea. That said, there are very well-known networking ports, both internally and externally. It's important that you don't conflate with either a typical router or your typical operating system. So Windows has you know standard ports. Mac OS has standard ports. Um, you need to be sure that you don't conflict with either one. Go ahead, uh, JJ. I've uh, listed that port list from Mayana in Makana, so you can reference that, the known list of like, ports. I would like to point out that I think we've nearly doubled all the ticket requests ever for, <laughs> you, for a universe standard. They were at 112, we're now at 215. If you're not part of the party, get 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 over there. There's a link there. You go, we we want to double it, so we're trying to get to 224. 224 is what we're looking for. Diamond all right, hands. All right. Yeah. Next question. <laughs> Frank Haney of Ottawa says, "What's the difference between orange and white in log?" And that's from Orion Z Slater. Mm -hmm. So that we give you this is a a feature request that came in for um, uh, color based logging levels. So uh, the colors are ugly. <laughs> Sorry about that. That was the last thing that we did before we released. Um, I need to go through and standardize them between the apps. But this is because we let you filter. So you can filter for all information, warnings, errors, um, status updates, and Mac OS. There's like five different verbosity levels in Mac OS and three in Windows. Um, and, uh, there's, um, so that it's, it's for ease of use when you're trying to figure out, you know, I, I only want to see the errors. I don't need to see all the other information. There's actually a hidden menu in Zoom OSC that has even more information than that. But the, um, the, uh, the sort of the only utility reason to set this around is if you have massive scale meetings. And I mean, like you're pushing up against the limits of what you can do in Zoom. Um, that's where you might see a slowdown in Zoom OSC with all that login going on. So setting that to none uh, is a great way to get some extra performance out of the software when it's not logging all that stuff. So it's particularly true in Mac OS, just the way that Zoom is built in Mac. Um, set that logging level to none if you're if you've got you know 
um, very, very large Zoom meetings. Next question. Andy Dolph in Durham, North New Hampshire says, I don't know how much is possible, but it's super frustrating that in Zoom or Zoom OSC, Windows don't remember where I've moved them on at least on a Mac. I wish there was a way to force them to at least stay on the correct monitor. I I do not know how to do that. There might be a third party app that can help you. Go ahead, Tucker, and then David. I'm hoping my brain doesn't fail me. Uh, better Snap Tool is a tool that I've used and you can do presets. So you can actually set up like kind of a Windows mode, drag to the left, drag to the right. You can also set presets where you'd say, use this preset and it goes Chook, and puts everything where you want it. Better Snap Tool. Yeah, and the same, I uh, use Magnet on the Mac. It's a similar product, just snaps right to where you want them. Um, uh, next question. Moving on to Ray Harris in Houston. I just uh, just to finish my connect the dots on the four dummies question. As an example, to get a message that a participant has turned on their video, where do you put the person's username? Good news. That's the that's the one thing you don't need to do. Um, so that is so that's where you use the subscribe level to think about what category of user that is. So let's say let's say we're just in a uh, a four person meeting, and you want to get um, a, a notification when any person in the call does anything. Set your subscribe level to all. And then in, let's say you're in Isadora, you're going to listen to the address slash Zoom OSC slash user slash video off, capital O on off. Now, when uh, that's going to have a, I believe it has four channels of, of return. So you're going to, you're going to assign four channels to it. When you open it up in the OSC multi-listener, put you know your four channels down there. Now, when anybody in the call does an action that would turn their video off, you'll see their target ID, their username, their position in the gallery view and their zoom ID populate on channels one, two, three, and four. And then you can use that information to do whatever you want. You know, you'll get a trigger about when that happens, you can put their name on screen. You could send them a direct message, asking them to turn their video back on. You can do all that kind of stuff. So uh, you get those four elements. Um, and that comes in when you uh, set up the channel and subscribe to all. Next question. Ed Woolick of uh, Valley College Cottage, New York. Can you set a range of ports in Zoom OSC for sending and listening to commands between multiple instances and controllers? So you wouldn't need to set up uh, uh, maybe, and maybe somebody with more networking experience, correct me if I say anything that's wrong here, but the way I use Zoom OSC, I have multiple pieces of software that can talk to it because it doesn't care who, who it's coming from. Just as long as you're sending a 9090, that does not cause a conflict. Um, uh, so you can have as many things send to Zoom OSC as you want from anywhere. Now on the return side, um, you do have to specify an IP address, but you can use a, um, a broadcast address uh, to be able to send those packets to all IPs on a specific port. Um, and then once it comes back into the ecosystem, they can pull on the, the, um, the local loopback, they can pull in whatever is on that port there and they should be able to share that. Go ahead, Beju. So Andy, so what you're saying from what I understand now is that even though you define in Zoom OSC which port you're listening or which IP address you're receiving commands from, it will still accept commands from any other IP from the sub subnet. So you don't, really you, don't, you don't set the IP that you, re that you receive from. You only set the port for receive. The one that you set is the transmit. And that one can be a broadcast address to transmit to everything on the, on the network. Um, and then they can receive based on that. But you don't, you never, Zoom OSC will listen to... Um, only the, specific, only the port, and it listens to, I believe the way it works under the hood is that when you send something, and I apologize because I'm going to simplify this more than it should be simplified, but when you send a, uh, a message on LAN to a computer, what it does is it pulls that in and it puts it on the same port in the, in the local environment so that when it binds to that, it doesn't care whether it came from something external or it came from something domestic. It's there on port 9090. Um, so you don't have to, you don't have to tell it that you're receiving from a specific IP address. It just knows that when it comes into the computer, it's on the local loopback and it's there, it's available for you to pick up on, on that port. Tucker. Yeah. Think of it like a PO box. Um, you basically say, this is the PO box that that is, that that instance is going to go get messages from. It doesn't know and doesn't care where those come from. It's just going to check that PO box. Next question. Uh, technically is the one that uh, Leland already answered right, from James right. in Dublin, Ireland, but by clicking on it now, we've at least put it into the Mukana uh, logs, or I'm sorry, the Discord logs of the show. So the answer was not yet. Uh, right, Ward Cameron. Leland, Leland, you were going to say. Yeah, if yeah. I got mute. Just curious uh, oh, if yeah, Andy yeah. has contacted the developer yet or not, who is Dead Mouse, uh, is the original developer of that software. Have you had any luck yet, Andy? Um, no, I haven't had anything come back yet, but. Um... 
Maybe we go there next. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Crew. They've got a, <laughs> they've got a forum. They've yeah. got a forum site right there on their website. So if everybody yeah, wants I'll to open up, their forum, I'll open up a forum post and then I'll put it in Discord and we can go hit it there. Or yeah, check out the VMix good. one too when you get a chance. <laughs> I already <laughs> got it. Thanks, Leland. I saw right, that today. Yeah. Next question. Okay, moving toward Cameron's of Banff, Alberta, Canada. Is there a way to change the Zoom links to open in Zoom OSC? So we do have deep linking support on Mac OS. The way that it works is you can't, um, well, you can't use Chrome because of the way the Chrome is built. But if you use like Firefox, it says open link with, and you can choose Zoom or you can choose Zoom OSC. When it opens with Zoom OSC, it launches you right into the meeting just like regular Zoom. So we'll um, we'll expand uh, deep linking support as we proceed, but it's um, it's there in that sort of rudimentary state. Right now, at Benjamin. Um, somebody recently asked if uh, there's a way to set your name when you're opening a meeting from DeepLink. Yes, you can. Uh, oh, when you open it from DeepLink, no. When you open it from CLI, yes, there's an argument that you can send, but you can't. Uh, can't set the name unless you. Uh, I believe the only way to do that is if you log into Zoom OSC with an account, it'll pull the account name as default, and then you can deep link in, and it should populate the account. All right, go ahead, Thanks. Craig. Um, and then could you, sorry, could you do uh, either of those things using Apple Script on the Mac? Yes, yes, that's the one we do have easy support for. So um, you can talk to Benjamin or Ashley Green on our Slack group, and you can get some scripts that will show you how to do that. And you can in email us at info at liminalet.com. If you're trying to build your own script, we'll give you the, the parameters that you can use to get set up with that. We just don't publish that documentation for security reasons. So, so could we do an Apple script that gives you the option to open Zoom in either Zoom or Zoom OS? Yeah, you totally, you should be able to. Yeah, I wouldn't see why not. Yeah, that, that'd be great. Thanks. Go ahead, Tucker. Um, could you do the, the automated join and then do a rename uh, function through Zoom OC delayed? Yeah, we just have to add the rename function. <laughs> we haven't. We don't actually have a, um, a rename OSC yet. That'll come in uh, hopefully either 403 or 404. Nice. Thanks. Next question. Barry Williams in London and the UK. Sometimes contributors try to mute themselves immediately after the host has muted them, resulting in them accidentally unmuting again. Is there a way that a user can see an overlay on the screen when their own hand is raised? Yes, using the feedback system. So this is, um, uh, I don't know that this would solve the office hours trouble that we're having right now, but the like the general case is, yeah, if you wanted to build like a custom monitor that was like uh, an alpha overlay, you know, that had information and statistics about your own participation. Yeah, you could use the, you would then you would do the opposite of what Ray needs to do. And you would listen to it slash zoom OSC slash me slash all the user actions. And then that would tell you only things that are happening by yourself. Next question. Uh, Marty Adius of Silver Springs, Maryland is looking for better location in GitHub for the Zoom OSC and companion nightly builds. I suppose he was looking for GitHub addresses or whatever. Yeah, you got to get it from, yet. Yeah, this is the thing with companion. You got to make an account, you got to log in, and then you go to the build section and then you see it there. Um, that's just how they do it. So sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Now we move to our last question. TJ Asher of Minneapolis, Minnesota says, on a Mac, I accidentally closed the window that holds the join meeting and schedule blue buttons, but could not find a way to get the window back without closing and restarting the app. It was not listed under the window menu. Am I missing something? Um, you know, it's so funny. I get I get some tickets to say, I can't close this, and I want to. And I get some people saying, I closed it. What do I do? And and I think what we did last week is in 402, we should have stopped it from being possible to close. Uh, but I think this is the other window that you're talking about. Um, uh, so I, I don't know, actually, um, to be honest with you. If, it's, if there's something that we need to stop you from being able to close, let me know, and we can turn that off. And we got a late... Late entry here, Ray Harris in oh, Houston. We got, uh, we're going to go back to TJ for a second. TJ. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, this is the window I'm talking about here. Aha. The one with the, those buttons on. I closed it, and then I couldn't, and I hadn't started a meeting. I couldn't get back. I had to close the app. So what it's supposed to do, what Zoom tells us it does when it happens, is it logs you out when you hit that button. But apparently now it just quits you. <laughs> That's not how it's supposed to work. That's not how yeah, any of yeah. the other apps work. Okay. Yeah. It just, it just, I, I still had the Zoom OSC Pro um, settings window open. All right. So. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll fix that. Thanks, TJ. <laughs> Tucker, Tucker, then Benjamin, and then David. Uh, I just posted it as a question in Mukana, so I'll let it come up there. Okay. Great. Uh, Benjamin. 
uh also on the same note there uh, when you click that when you close that button when you close that little window you always stay signed in um it seems as though the only way to log out on mac os is to hit the logout menu underneath the zoom osc top menu bar yeah this is the stuff that drives me crazy it's like the documentation and the and the reality are just two different worlds yeah well so. it's not just mac because it happened to me yesterday during a, an event that i was doing at work on a windows machine and couldn't figure out how to get that control panel back up to that's so strange because Anyway, yeah, well, I'll I'll badger Zoom about that. Uh, uh, go ahead, uh, Leland. I even had a problem with the latest build that you did. If you close that window, it goes back to the login prompt for your username and password, but does not close that window on a PC. So just more input for you. To use. Yeah, that's and that's the expect. That, that's what I'm expecting it to do. So if it's not yeah. doing that, that's very peculiar. Go ahead, TJ. Do they all have the 4.0.2 installed? Question. Uh, yeah, I'm on 4.0.2. Uh, next question. Uh, we got a couple extra. Ray Harris came in from Houston with, has anyone used their pre-written Stream Deck buttons with Companion? Andy, any plans to work directly with Stream Deck? So this is, um, so with Companion, we do have our preset available through our website that you can download and get up and running with 402 right away by downloading that. Um, working directly with Stream Deck without Companion, um, I was actually talking with my colleague on the way uh, to work um, about that, actually, and we, we can explore that. So the, 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 the thing that I'm trying to decide, just to sort of give you an insight into what I'm thinking about right now is, you know, we've got, we've got the software, then we have the integrations, and we have the other things in our ecosystem. And what I'm trying to figure out is how do I allocate resources between progressing the software, talking to the partners, try to get them to make builds, and then making first party builds to get people using those platforms. And how do we allocate, you know, for Companion, I think that's how most people are going to interact with Zoom OSC, to be frank. I think a lot of people will just download Companion and, and use the instance variables and go. So it made sense for us to invest thousands and thousands of dollars into a really good Companion instance, right? Um, does that make sense on on vanilla stream deck maybe it does maybe that would have even more adoption right so i'm just trying to um i'm trying to play that game and figure out you know for who, who is who is responsible and who foots the bill when we try to make an integration you know is it the integrator is I, it us you know how does it work i do think that a some kind of light version of zoom osc that isn't free but isn't the same price that the average user could just use like someone could just use it just to make their life better and they just turn it on and they, you know they're not trying to run events they're not trying to do anything else they just want to make it a better thing and it worked with stream deck would be probably swamp I, I say this with with uh care because i'm afraid that if you did that you would stop talking to the developers <laughs> i mean you know like like you know that like for instance i mean to put it in perspective uh you know like black magic makes a lot of great switchers and then they put out the mini you know, I don't know what the numbers are, but my guess is the mini was 95% of their sales last year, mm. you know, like 95, 98. I mean, I bet you it was somewhere in that range. And so there, there's a huge, there's oftentimes a huge uh, market for something that I don't have to know anything. I just want to plug it in. I want to run a slightly better business meeting, you know, and I want to, you know, be able to just tap, tap stream deck and make it work is different than what we're doing right now. Right. You know, and you could end up with like every person that, you know, it could be the sales could be you know, astronomically larger um, because if it was not something that they have to think about at all, like they just turn, you know, the stream deck just pops in. They just drag a couple buttons in, they can move them around and it just works. Yeah. So that would be the only thing that I would I would say that it's probably a good business, but I would say that for, as a geek, I'm afraid that you'll do it because then I'm afraid <laughs> that you'll be like, I don't have any resources for you anymore. You know, so anyways. Right. right. And that's anyway. the thing, too, is like, and that's why I, <laughs> that's why I'm so interested in things like, you know, what um, what educators could do with this or something like that. Right. So, so if somebody takes us and builds that. Right. That's what Maestro right. was. Maestro was literally like you sign up for the platform, you get a stream deck in the mail and a flash drive and you're done. And everything else is handled for you by the integrator. And then we are sort of in there as an embedded solution. But you're totally right that like it's lucrative, right? It's lucrative for us to just do it first party and and cut out all that in between and, and, and the reliance on somebody to go build it. But what I do hope is that especially after these training sessions, somebody takes the torch into a lot of places right. that we can't go and yep. opens up those markets, right? So that's the yeah, that makes that's sense. Thing uh, Tucker. Yeah, the um I was just wondering if there's any kind of, and I know this is like a kind of maybe a weird, weird question or weird thing, but um, do you have anything like a Patreon or something where people that want to just support you for what you're doing can support you for what you're doing? Amen. You know, I think um, 
I think, well, we could talk about opening something like that up. I appreciate the sentiment too. Um, uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to be careful right around the, because for, for Zoom OSC for so long was a free application and, you know, and we didn't ask for anything and we didn't, and we didn't, there was no way to pay Liminal for anything that we did. Um, and we did that because we, we weren't exactly sure what we were, where we were going with it. Uh, I didn't want to introduce a donation platform at the same time as a paid product tier, because I thought that would send the wrong message. Um, but I think that especially as we continue to show the goodwill that we have towards the free version of Zoom OSC and all the things that it can do and um, the things that we're trying to build out, uh, whether it's a feature bounty, because I, I like to, I appreciate the assignment of donations, but I always like to give people something in return uh, for what they're doing and, or at least to give them some sense of what it would go towards. And it, it, you know, early on, we had talked about a feature bounty system for Zoom OSC, and then we decided to go a different route because we didn't, we didn't want to have the, um, the, uh, what we felt was a sort of moral responsibility to do things that you know, we had to rely on Zoom for, right? So I, I think um, the thing, I mean, even if it was a, pro oh, I'm sorry, Alex, go ahead. I was going to say t-shirts. Like t-shirts. <laughs> like, I'm just saying, but I'm saying like, do, do, are you selling those t-shirts? Uh, not yet. We we could though. Um, I'm just saying like, like, you know, it. this is like one of those things like, where, and especially if it's like a, a limited edition t-shirt for like 25 bucks cost you make it a nice shirt so it's like cost you like 12 10 well, you just blew like out that. my big closing question which is tuckers but it's <laughs> yeah, all right let's do it now <laughs> there's a lot you know the the uh there's there's certain times when you when you get that there's a, a product that you want to, people to know that you had that first you know like the you know whatever whatever it is that you had that shirt um it, and it's an easy way for people to support you and it would just be but i think you guys could probably when you have something that's very vertical i don't know how many you'd sell but it'd be more than 10, you know, and, and I mean, I think half the people here at least would buy them and uh, maybe that's not enough, but you can get things that are done largely re remote. You know, you don't have to do much other than upload an EPS file, you know, yeah. to, and have it managed, uh, you know, whatever t-shirt cafe or whatever they call it, but just get nice shirt. That's my, that's my only yeah, request. Nice shirts. Yeah. Shirts. Some of us Good would shirts. probably pay and, uh, 50 bucks for one just to say that we were there when it exactly, began. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's not, it's not really the number because we know that we're supporting you. Maybe we're not ready to subscribe to it every, every month, but we're, I mean, I am, but, but that, that the people want those kinds of things, the hat, the shirt, the thing, you know, so right. I would, I would highly recommend that. Well, we'll look at a merch store. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Jen. You know, with all the millionaires in this room, what about angel investments? You know, have you ever thought of that? You know, it's funny. One of the things that um, uh, has been, so we try to always define like, what what is our company? <laughs> like, what are we? Like, are we a tech startup? Are we a small business? Are we, a, you know, what are we? And we've led towards the um, the small business route because, you know, when we started this, it was, it was really um, a production company, to be frank, it was, it was, we had the software that we were financing by doing production, taking the profits from it and paying for the development of Zoom OSC. Um, and in that sense, we worked under that model. Now we're sort of in more of the tech startup route where we're really, you know, putting tons of tons of time and energy into pumping up the software to hopefully get it to pop off. Um, but, uh, we're not doing some things that startups do like taking in large amounts of investment and taking out big loans and, and doing that kind of thing. Um, and, I would say that, you know, it's maybe it's an identity crisis, but I think it's also just like trying to respond to the to the moment of, of especially with COVID out there. I think we're, what we're trying to do here is is have something that's a little more stable than a, than a startup, but is also able to move quickly um, by being small and flexible. So. By the way, I want to apologize. I didn't I didn't see Tucker's comment about t-shirts when i said t-shirts i was like oh i took i, took, I just stole tucker's uh, close tucker had it up okay. there before before that you know i what? feel bad that i said if the that. two of us have the same thought yeah. that's that's flattering <laughs> but yeah you know like i mean the, the same thing about i mean I, I don't know if we take investment for it but i mean like but with both uh Mukon, Mukana is very similar to that in the sense that we're trying you know we may eventually expand it much faster but there's a power to doing it slowly for a while, letting it slow cook. Same thing with our community here. You know, I could go out and expand it very quickly to, you know, 10 times the size, but there's a certain, you, you get a very porous community or a very porous app development when you grow it really fast. There's just lots of air bubbles. And so, right. so, you know, if you want it to be dense, it just takes time, you know. Um, next question. Was from TJ Asher. Uh, on the liminal side, and I'm, I'm looking there on the liminal side, and I'm not finding the companion config file to download. Can someone smarter than me post the link in Mukana? Oh, I, 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 uh, I won't claim that I'm smarter than you, but I did put the link in Mukana. <laughs> so. 
Oh, you're smarter than me. Okay. <laughs> Um, did you, did, Andy, you had a couple other things you wanted to show? Yeah. So I wanted to talk just real quick, um, as sort of a primer for next week about remote control, cause I think it's going to be, mm -hmm. it's going to be tricky, um, uh, if we dive into it, um, cold. So I just yep. wanted to so say a couple of things about that. So, um, I've, and I've added this to the user manual when you go through it's on some, one of the last pages in the manual, a description of what I'm going to say. So you can feel free to reference that offline, but the idea with remote control is that if you have zoom OSC on both ends, you can do some things that you can't do by just having, you know, a zoom there. So there's things that you would like, like being able to set camera, mic level, um, uh, speaker level, all sorts of different things there, what view they're in, um, which you can do under certain circumstances, but not others showing the usernames on the video for somebody else or not. Like there's, there's reasons that you do this in a production house where you just want remote control of different things. And there's reasons that you do this over WAN. So my company has a couple of solutions for doing things over WAN. As you know, we got Streamweaver ecosystem, which is for the OSC, genuine OSC transport over IP. But if you don't want to do that, we've opened up a back channel using the chat system. And there's a couple of different use cases and reasons that you might want to do this. So let's say you have a theatrical event and you have a stage manager. And the stage manager, you're not going to put Zoom OSC on their machine, but you are putting Zoom OSC on the machine where all the tech is located. That stage manager can send a specially formatted macro from their computer to Zoom OSC to trigger QLab, for example, or something like that. They can also, um, you can also just uh, keep a bank of these and copy paste them in and be able to control talent if the talent is running this. So that's like the very, that's the first way, that's the manual way. It's the chat macros, it's entering things into a field, DMing it to somebody and getting some response from their instance. That's probably um, the most niche, like it will help in various particular circumstances, but um, it's, it's very limited in what it can do. The thing that is uh, really expansive in terms of its possibilities is the automated chat macros. So the, the reason, the whole reason this whole time that we've had this concept of user actions is because of remote control. A user action can be called on somebody, but there are things that you can, you cannot do in Zoom that you can do with a user action. So for example, if I want to turn on non-video participants on somebody else's behalf, right? There's no API call to do that. But when you do slash zoom slash user name slash, you know, uh, uh, show names on non-video participants or whatever the call is, right? And then you pass in the username of the person you want to fire that on. What will actually happen is if you both have remote control enabled, it will send that chat message automatically. That's the action that it takes. And then the receiving party will process that, make sure it has the right security level and will turn that into a call to the API. So it's this sort of, it's this back route to be able to remote control things. Again, why would you do something like this? Well, let's say you're again in the theater and you are the sound engineer and you've deployed uh, Zoom OSC Pro on all of the talent computers, let's say. And now you want to be able to take a, a slider, a MIDI fader, and Plalik was doing this the other day. So definitely check in with him to see a concrete example of this. But you want to fade that fader up and down and mix their mic in and out, right? That That's what this kind of thing opens up through the remote control system. Um, and that uh, is what I want you guys to play with this week. Cause I think it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's, it's perhaps it's niche and perhaps it's, you know, not what you'll do 99% of the time, but it opens up a lot of options for zoom that you might not have otherwise. And it's just a, it's another interesting Avenue to go down. Um, uh, and again, just to sort of summarize, you've got Streamweaver if you want genuine data transport over IP and you don't want to clog up the chat system, you have chat macros, which is, um, pound, pound or dollar sign, dollar sign, depending on what you're trying to do. And you can see it in the documentation, how to format the macro. And you have user actions that can automatically create those that you can send automatically through the chat without having to type anything in. So that's what you're going to be looking at this week. And I'll, again, I'll write up the, the assignment in the documentation, but it's going to be basically having the instances talk to each other. And, um, I'm going to ask the next question. Just so I want to rephrase it a little bit. Um, will there be a uh, kind of a receive level like something that can just follow a follower uh level of purchase you know to use chat like so that you could send something out to them and it would it would do it w without a full cost we can explore that for sure i think you know what i what i didn't want to do is i didn't want to have 50 million different licensing options on on day one for mm -hmm. it so as you'll see we have right now we have the monthly option on monday we're launching the um the annual option which will give you two months free when you do that and then um, for our enterprise friends, we've come up with completely customized plans for how they're doing that. For the um, for the use case where you don't, you're not buying such a volume that we consider an enterprise, but you are just enough that you want to do it for a particular period of time and, and in a certain way, we might be able to find something out there. Um, 
the only thing I'd say is that if if Zoom OSC is going to play that level of role in the infrastructure of an event, people pay you know quite a bit of money for pipe and drape for something, right? And if this is your pipe and drape, then I I I I, I want to think about it both ways because I think it I think it adds a lot of value, and I want to I want to I want to not spend um, a lot of time and money making it so granular that we lose focus on, you know, what, what is the purpose of this tier? But I think it's a good idea. And I think it's, it's something that um, I need to work through in my head a little bit more about how it would function and how it would work. And that question was from L Armstrong in Denver. Um, next question. Uh, Jan Landy here on the panel says, is there going to be a test kitchen after this meeting? So you can post, if so, can you post a link to Makana? We're not going to change it. So what we're going to do is we're just going to, I'm going to close the YouTube here in a second, and then we'll just leave it. We'll just leave this one open. There's, I'll add some breakout rooms so people can break out into it, but there's no reason for us in this case to uh, switch gears because we have breakout rooms. The reason we, do, I realize why, why are we making everybody go somewhere when we can just create those? So uh, anyway, here. Andy, you were going to show, were you going to show anything else? I think that's all or for now. Here. I'll be around to answer questions um, if, if anything should come up this week, of course, and I'll be here for a little bit to talk through any specific, you know, use case questions. Oh, uh, we got one more question coming in from Ash. Go ahead. Let me move it over. And what recommendations do folks have to use Zoom OSC in a corporate environment to make meetings better? I'll slip in with a quick one, but then I definitely want to hear the the group's opinion on this. There was an event that I became aware of, um, which was really interesting to me. It was in our showcase channel. This guy Jarno is one of our one of our power users, and he did um, a TV event with um, six hundred pinned live feeds. Um, all managed by Zoom OSC for an event that was broadcast to over a million people. And um, he just had tables and tables of operations and inputs and all of that. And, it, and, it, and there was cloud infrastructure involved and it was, it was a, a real big thing. And I, I don't believe it was corporate, but it was, um, we have done some corporate things with it, but I'll, I'll turn it over to the panel. But I just, I was amazed to see how large that could scale up. I mean, 600 pins, that's, that's blows my mind. I I was I tweeted this out yesterday that and I talked about it a little bit earlier this morning, so I won't belabor it. But but I really it really became clear. I was talking to somebody about events that I truly believe I don't believe physical events are going anywhere. We'll have plenty of physical events, but the largest events by 2023 will be online. They will not there will not be hybrid. They will not be in between. And what you just talked about is the point towards what's going to happen where you have, you know, millions of people attending you know, from all over the world, you know, and if anything that there's physical outputs, it's just watch parties, you know, like at, at people's companies or at organizations, they can, you know, watch it and interact. They'll be sitting there asking questions in Makana or something else or whatever. But the point is that they can be asking questions and chatting amongst everyone in the world, but they have a physical output, but the physical part of it, the hybrid part will not be streaming the physical experience. It will be watching the virtual experience together. You know, like that's where I think that that's the that's where we're going to see a shift and think tools like Zoom OSC and other things. That's why I'm so one of the reasons I'm so excited about Zoom OSC is I think it's one of the things that enables, you know, that that uh, that that tables turning thing that's going on. Um, go ahead, Jason, and then Tucker. I um, I've already used it to do stuff like significantly cut down on onboarding time. You know, you you, you deploy a remote kit. And setting it up is so much easier when you've got control over this stuff just straight away. Um, next, next question. Oh, I'm sorry, hey, Tucker. Tucker. Are you okay? Ahead. Yes. I mean, as far as it's kind of like QLab in a way of like you can start and make your immediate events that you're dealing with, corporate or otherwise, better just by starting to use the pen function. So just the really basic, like I can now pen or spotlight appropriately and, and, and control it really simply with companion and that. And I think that just like QLab and QLab, it's like I can play two channel audio really, really well. And then as you go, the tool, you'll, you'll realize that there are edges of the tool that you're not hitting yet and you'll just continually improve. Um, so yeah, you'll be able to use it all over the place. Next question. AV Trainer OSC001 from Washington says, would it make sense to not have a Zoom OSC breakout room, but instead leave the Zoom OSC discretion in the main room and have the breakouts for everything that isn't Zoom OSC? So flip the yeah, so, after show. Yeah, so um, because so many people have their, AV Trainer's got a great point, and AV Trainer desperately wants to listen and not have to turn on 
this camera. Um, and so uh, I, 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 I get where that that question's coming from. I see, I see, I uh, I see the point there. Um, so what we're going to do is we created a bunch of breakout rooms. Um, we will have because so many people have their cameras off in this case, and for for whatever reasons, um, and because it's a, a, a it's a little different than our normal post shows. You can go ahead and um, we'll have Andy stay in the main room. If you want to keep talking about other things other than what Andy's doing, you can go into the breakout rooms. Rules still apply that if you go into a breakout room, you can you have to have your camera on. You cannot go into a breakout room without your camera on. Um, all you know, you have to keep it on to go in there. So, but otherwise, we'll we'll continue. We'll just let this be open. If people want to do kind of a test kitchen, as long as Andy wants to hang out and other people can keep on doing it. Um, you can do that, but if you want to go to the there's there's some Zuo Omo OSC breakout rooms, but Andy will, if if it's okay, stay stay here, yeah, I'll and answer around. questions, yep. and then um, but if you want to talk about other things, if you want to geek out on something other than what we're talking about here, those are for the other other discussions. Go ahead, TJ. Uh, camera on and not pointed at the ceiling, but pointed at you, so yeah. we can see your. Face. You have to be on the camera. You have to be on the can. You can't. Yeah, it's and this is based just so you guys know it's based on historical experience, so. Um, uh, if if our moderators see you uh, without your camera on or pointed up or whatever in a breakout room, you'll just get kicked out. You know, I'm not saying it'll happen immediately, but if we wander around and see someone uh, and see that, we'll kick you out immediately. Um, and so, just uh, just know that you have to leave it on. Go ahead, David. So, it's a it's a security feature. <laughs> so I, was gonna I say, do wish is, that Zoom would tell us whether cameras were on or off. That, when, that's what I was just going to get to. Is there a way that Zoom OSC could monitor those breakout rooms the snitch, <laughs> <laughs> snitch, Call it the snitch. but on no, a, it would on be a, really useful to know whether mics are open or closed and you, whether people you, you can absolutely break can rooms. you put zoom osc it in every breakout room and then call the list command and it will populate and say okay here's who got this who's who, here's who has that and well, we can also just set the feature up that if you turn off your camera <laughs> you, can you turn off your camera it. in a breakout room it just there's goes a, there's, a, there's an eject command yeah you can literally just just like off you go i just wanted to raise one other point Back to the integration with Stream Deck Native, I think as a if there were a way to make it a portable app so you could ship a C-level executive a six-button Stream Deck and a USB key, send it out to them, and whatever the top six functions that you might find out of what Zumo C is doing or... Uh, well, again, like even having that be able to subscribe back to an, a button so that for, you know, if you... You know, the, the experience that I have with Tucker, for instance, when Tucker is setting up comms for me, I'm like, can you move this to here? Can you do this, add, add this thing? And, and so being able to have a, a, a an executive just be able to go, I really wish this button was right here and then just have it change would be um, pretty ninja. You know, so um, anyway, we're going to let you guys have general discussion uh, and just stay. You can either go into other rooms or stay here. We'll leave it open for a while all afternoon if we if there's lots of people here. Um, but remember just to keep your camera on and on you uh, if you're going to be in a breakout room. Come back here if you're going to pause or do anything else. Just know that it may not happen, but it may happen instantly if you are uh, go to a breakout room and and and, um, and pause your video. Okay. Anyway, I'll let you guys keep talking. And a couple of more questions oh. are coming in, so I'll stick yeah. around for a while and and manage Ouch, questions. YouTube. Oh yeah, let me let me kill the. Uh, I think you have to make YouTube. me host. Did you make me host?